talking about when we were in the parking lot. Cruiser comes up and he says, how much? How much? I said, Jim, it's not for sale. He says, <laughs> and he storms off. That was quite a time. This is the object of my presentation, ladies and gentlemen. And I need to tell you also that uh, I had to go through a lot of effort to bring this here. This bowling ball bag came from like a Kmart or something that's in Ithaca. It's a standard like a Brunswick. Yeah, it says Brunswick on here. It fit in here perfectly. At the time, Jim and Judy were still living on 2nd Avenue in Ithaca, just before we moved them up there. Now remember, this is 1999. I was back here in 2001, and please forgive my language, I busted my ass to help Jim and Judy move from Ithaca to Trumansburg, which is their home now. And on the morning of September 11th, too tired to sleep and too sore, I'm on the back porch of their beautiful two-story home in Trumansburg, and Jim went to the store to get groceries for making breakfast. And he comes back in the car to hook up the dryer, or I heard it on the radio. <laughs> so he's sitting in the car for like a half an hour. I'm going, what the hell is going on with him? And I'm just sitting there, too tired to move. I'm laying on a chaise lounge on this beautiful porch, elevated, looking down on the driveway. And finally, he comes up with this bag of groceries. He said, Jim, what's wrong? He goes in the house. He has this five tube vacuum tube radio with leaky capacitor so there's this you know but he's listening to ABC News and what's his name uh, come on Peter Jennings thank you mind mind block is describing live the action of what happened on the North Tower. We had just finished moving him and Judy at uh, like midnight, 1 a.m. in the morning. So I knew where the TV sets were, and these guys do not watch commercial television over the air, terrestrial airwave television. They play videotapes, and that's all they do. But I figured, okay, Trumansburg is a rural area. Maybe I can find some pieces of wire I can, can fashion like some rabbit ears to make an antenna, and maybe we can try and get some reception. So we have this snowy colored picture, but we did watch it. So we watched the second plane go live into the South Tower. It took me five days to get back from New York <laughs> to LA. But that's another story. My point is this. In this post 9-11 era, you know how difficult it is to travel with carry-on items. I was determined to bring what's in this bag here for this conference. I went through a lot of pain and consternation. I talked to three people in the TSA, Transportation Security Agency, in LA. And so finally I sent faxes to their office showing this documentation of the original purchase and pictures of the motor. And this lady calls me back, wonderful person. Her name is Lenny. And she says, I don't see any problem with this, and I can't believe that you have Tesla's first motor. This is incredible. I've shared it with everybody here in the office. <laughs> Turns out she's very educated. She knows about Tesla, and her colleagues are all very surprised about how much she knows about Tesla. But that's why we're all here tonight, is to learn more about Tesla. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you what Jim Coram, Jim Hardesty, and I consider to be the very first prototype, tabletop, demonstration motor, two-phase, alternating current demonstration motor to come out of Tesla's Fifth Avenue workshop. This is it. This is a plinth that is a full 12 inches by 6 inches by a full 2 inches thick. Now, millwrights in the woodworking industry would know that this is too thick to be in modern times. The insulation, which is broken that you see here, is gutta percha. <clears throat> so it's very authentic. Now the idea was is you had a generator here and a generator here, and depending on which phase you closed first or second, the rotor would rotate this way or that way. But if you come up, and you're welcome to come up and study this, 
the construction of this motor matches identically to the May 1888 patent for Tesla. Our belief collectively is, and I want to invite Jim to come up and say some things about this as well. And Jim Hardesty and I have spent many hours at Cornell's research lab, uh, library <clears throat> in a basement, like two floors down. I don't know how many of you people have been there, but you have to write to them in advance you have to say what it is you were trying to research. And when you go there, you <coughs> empty your pockets. It's like going through a security screening. And while you're down, two floors down in this basement at Cornell, in this library, there are armed guards up above who are watching your every move. And if you want to have something Xeroxed, you write a slip of paper and you pass it to somebody and they get it Xeroxed for you. Because those are all original documents. So we were going through Professor Anthony's documents to see about correspondence between Tesla and Anthony. Jim also went to Cambridge in England and did further research, and I want to invite him to say what he knows about the connection of this motor to Anthony from Tesla. Our belief is that maybe Tesla's assistant, Sagetti, and this would be at his uh, Fifth Avenue laboratory before it burned down, at Tesla's direction and by Tesla's supervision, built this to send to Anthony, Professor Anthony at Cornell. And by the way, something nobody has said any here, has said here, is that Anthony, William S. Anthony, he started the electrical curriculum, the electrical engineering department at Cornell. It's because of him that Cornell has electrical engineering. Uh, several years later, after he started this curriculum, he went to the Board of Regents and said, I need more money for my department. The Board of Regents said, no. Anthony said, see ya, I'm out of here. So Anthony left Cornell, and he went to a different part of New York, and he started an engineering college called Cooper Union. Mm. Now, Cooper Union is very interesting because I have a personal connection to Cooper Union. My grandfather, who was born in Vienna, Austria, came to this country, like Tesla, <coughs> went to Cooper Union, got his EE degree in electrical engineering, circa 1919, I have the watch fob. It's one of my most prized possessions. My grandfather worked in electrical engineering all his life. He wrote one of the early books on underground electrical wiring. He was the editor for AIWE at the time. And Anthony was the director of engineering at Cooper Union at the time. So there's kind of like a connection there, I feel. Uh, what else to say here before I close? I am only a steward of this motor. There are a number of us that feel that this is the real McCoy. This is genuine. I have not done anything to it. It's exactly as I have received it, circa 1999. And it's interesting because it came from Cornell. I've got the documentation for, for that. Well, what happened to it after all those years? It was in a vault, some dark bowel area of Cornell, which Cornell is famous for. Jim Hardesty has reaped many rewards from things that were being discarded in the dumpster. We used to, when I would visit him in years prior, we used to go and go on dumpster raids at Cornell for the lots of goodies that were priceless. You know, they were valuable. They were, this is great, this is wonderful. They're throwing this out, we can't believe it. My point is, we believe that this is the start of the modern electrical revolution of alternating current, and here it sits, and it's real, and you can come up and you can touch it, and you can see it, and I invite you to ask me any questions, but I, I give to you in this room, and by the way, I want to say one more thing. I don't think anybody has thought about doing this, but let's take a piece of paper, Jim, and let's put it over there on that table, and let's have everybody in this room put their name 
their address, their phone number, and their email so that we have a record of everything that is happening here tonight for all these folks. Sir? You're thinking Tesla probably wound this himself, rather, right? Excuse me? Tesla probably wound this himself? No, I don't think Tesla wound this himself. He was too much of a meticulous machinist. I think Sagetti, his assistant, made this at his direction. And time was of the essence. And I think this goes actually to late 1887, yeah. Because the patent was given in May of 1888. Um, Anthony published on Tesla's behalf about the rotating magnetic field and a two-phase or polyphase alternating current motor. That is known. And Tesla's patent as granted in May of 1888 <coughs> looks exactly like the construction of this motor. So Tesla probably watched the thing spin around at least. Oh, sure. <laughs> Absolutely. Our belief is that from Fifth Avenue, this was shipped up to Cornell in Ithaca. Anthony reviewed it, and then he put it in storage. And decades later, it surfaces at a rummage sale. These two staffers at Cornell buy it, for 75 cents, then they've got too much stuff in their house because it's a small house, it's Ithaca, you know. And so they put it up for auction on eBay, and I see it, and that's where I come into the picture. Yes, go ahead. Have you speculated about what the generator was that would have driven this motor, in other words? Uh, yes, I have. And I think it would be two single-phase generators that were rotor-locked mechanically, but 90 degrees in phase rotate, rotated from each other, driven by a third power source. And so you could make the closing this one or this one, it would go this way or this way. By the way, the rest is all original here too. <laughs> as again, as I've said, I've preserved this exactly as it was obtained. And again, I say also, I consider myself only to be a steward of this marvelous piece of construction. And truly, ladies and gentlemen, you need to come up here and look at it very closely because it's interesting. This core is a laminated core. It's not solid metal. There are laminations here. There are two layers of winding here, 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 and here. And they're connected in series for opposing, opposing coils, like here and here and here and here. <clears throat> the rotor has two windings, exactly as Dr. Coram described, which are, to say, electrically shorted or shunted windings at 90 degree quadrature. And the core inside, which you can barely see, also has metal laminations. So we have a, mag, uh, a metal core here and here, and we have four windings, two at 90 degree angles here and here, and two sets of windings here and here. I'm sure it would be easily possible to make this work today, but because it is so ancient and it's so fragile, I thought it best not to do anything except to just preserve it exactly as it is. Yes, sir? Does the current reverse back and forth inside of those uh, short coils? Well, it's a, a buck boost system. It's standard laws of magnetics. You have, as Jim described in his paper, uh, you have a north and south pole at one moment, then you have a south and north pole at another moment. So it's inductive repulsion and attraction, or magnetic induction and retraction. So the outside coils are making a current in the wire, and that's making the pole itself. The rotating magnetic field happens in these outer coils. The inner coils, which are physically locked and shorted against one another, form permanent poles. So the salient pole feature is on the rotor, not the field. The field, which is the ring, the toroid ring, that is the rotating magnetic field. And incidentally, that's exactly the way that motors are made today. If you take apart a single phase, 60 hertz, capacitor start, induction run motor, you will see the lineage between this and a modern day motor that like runs a washing machine or anything else. The rotor, which 
in modern terms is called like a squirrel cage rotor. Those are not windings, but actually just pieces of metal that are electrically shorted, but it forms essentially the same physical function as what you see here. Are there two loops or one loops? One loop on the armature. Well, so in modern 60 hertz, either induction run in, uh, in uh, induction start or capacitor start induction run motors, it's what's called a shunted squirrel cage. So what you have is pieces of metal in a magnetic core. I, I, I should I should have thought to bring one to you to see tonight, but you can you can take a motor apart and see it for yourself, and it, it becomes very obvious. The, you see the progression from this to a modern day, and it's interesting too because to begin with, Tesla had no single phase alternating current motors. They were two phase or three phase, what he called his polyphase system. Okay, and here's one other thing I need to point out, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Dr. Safer was talking about the, the Columbia Exposition, 1893 or 1895, I forget. 93. 93. There was something that preceded that, and I want you all to make note of this. And this is very important also, and I will conclude here very shortly. How many people know where Telluride, Colorado is? Okay, great. Well then, maybe you are also aware of the Telluride Tech Festival? Show of hands, Telluride Tech Festival? Okay, all right. It turns out, and this is not widely known, how many people know the name Lucius Lucius Nunn? L.L. Nunn. Okay. Turns out that Telluride, Colorado was the very birthplace of alternating current. It preceded the Columbia Exposition. It preceded Niagara Falls. We're talking about the transition between the winter of 1890 to 1891 in January. L.L. Nunn was a very educated man, and he ran a mining operation in Telluride, Colorado, which is on the southwest slopes of that state. He sent his brother to go to Pittsburgh to meet with Westinghouse, knowing about Tesla and asking if Westinghouse and Tesla could provide a new form of energy to keep the mines open and running. Because prior to that, these mining operations were running on steam. Steam. Well, what does it take to make steam? Wood. you got to burn wood. You have to have a source of energy to make steam. So these mining companies in Colorado had already deforested most of the southwest of Colorado. So none took to having mule teams from the valley down below to bring in charcoal to burn, to make the boilers work, to make the mines work at $40 per ton. In those days, we're talking like 1890, $40. That's like $4,000 today. So he was aware of Tesla. He sent his brother to Pittsburgh, met with Westinghouse. Tesla designed a 60 hertz single phase motor rated at 100 horsepower. And Westinghouse built the alternator, and Western Union supplied the telephone poles and the insulators and the wire to go from what was called the Ames Hydroelectric Power Plant in Telluride, shipping it up two and a half miles up the mountainside to this mine, the Ames Gold Mine. It was successful. It worked. And None saved thousands and thousands of dollars because now he had cheap power and was more efficient. 60 hertz, which is by Tesla's design. Tesla picked that frequency, and there's a lot of reasons behind that. I won't go into that now. The other mining companies wanted in on this too. They were going broke because they had no power. They had no way to run their mining machines. It turns out that Telluride, Colorado, was the very first community in the United States and probably even the free world at the time for alternating current to be <coughs> illuminated. 
Lucius Nunn's house in Telluride was one of the first houses in downtown Telluride to get electrical power. Pretty soon the whole town is powered. The success of that operation in Telluride led to the Columbia Exposition, which led to Niagara Falls, which led to everything else that we have today. That's the progression, that's the lineage, that's the best I know of. Any other questions? Yes. Yes, sir. Um, the uh, laminations there, are they flat or coiled? They're flat. You're welcome to come up and look at it very closely. Is that on the outer ring as well as the center? Yes, the inner ring is actually laminations cut into a circular section of discs. You can see that if you look very closely, but it's hard to see. Again, I have not dissected this at all, but you can see very clearly the outer part is laminated, and by close ex examination, you can see that there are laminations also on the inner part, on this rotor. So it's a stack of discs and a stack of rings. Right, exactly. Correct. Yeah, that's described in detail in, in the patents. So, I mean, if you wanted to make one yourself, just read the patents. The whole idea is to reduce hysteresis sure. losses. Okay. Yes, sir. What frequency could you bring that up to you? That's an excellent question, and I do not know the answer to that. It might have been 33 hertz. It might have been 60 hertz, it might have been 100 hertz. I have no idea. You know, being a salient pole by construction motor, it's going to rotate at whatever frequency it's driven by, basically. <clears throat> Next question, yes, sir. Can you go more into detail why they chose 60 hertz as a standard frequency? I would like Dr. Jim Corum to answer that question because he has more knowledge than I do about that. But it has to do, again, with hysteresis losses. It has to do with uh, what, what you call efficiency of generation and of delivery of electricity and consumption of electricity. Am I right on that, Jim? Yeah. Uh, let's see. Maybe other people here that know more about it than I, than I but the story that I was told as an undergraduate was simply that uh, he, he plotted losses one way in the iron and losses another way in the copper. Right. And they crossed it about like 59 hertz. And he said, wow, if I put this at 60 hertz in the sweet spot, I can probably run the clocks and get them synchronized. Exactly. So there may be more to the story, but that was what they told me when I was a kid. And here's something interesting. Uh, in Colorado Springs, his experimental plant there, the El Paso, Power Company, which I happen to have from, I, I also want to mention one other name, ladies and gentlemen, I know I'm running late here. Um, I want to mention Leland Anderson. Lee Anderson is an incredible individual who has spent probably more than 50 years researching and acquiring priceless Tesla memor memorabilia, including photographs that are now in the possession of Friends of Science East and Breckenridge, Breckenridge Books, 21st Century Books, uh, um, Gary Peterson. You can see a number of those pictures. Well, all of this, for example. That all came from Lee Anderson. Well, one of the things that Lee Anderson didn't sell to Gary Peterson, a friend of Science East, was a number of documents which are like receipts and correspondence. Other than this motor, the other thing that I consider that I'm a steward of is this notebook an eight and a half by 11 notebook of memorabilia, which includes the receipt from the El Paso Electric Company for the repair of the generators there after Tesla shorted them out with his experiments at Colorado Springs. <laughs> I didn't think to bring that with me here. Uh, Lee Anderson, many of you know his publications, and if you don't, go online and Google Leland I. Anderson because he is like Dr. Coram and also others in this room like Dr. Safer uh, are widely published and speaking of Mark Safer I also have to say of all of the technical references and material that is available about Tesla that goes into great depth and great definition. I think Mark Safer's book is probably the best I've ever seen. And there's one other person I need to acknowledge in this room tonight that I haven't done. I'd like to have Jeff Beharry stand up 
Jeff is a contemporary of mine. Jeff owns what is called Turn of the Century Electrotherapy Museum. He's going to be speaking, I don't think, tonight or tomorrow. Is that right, Jeff? Sunday morning. Sunday morning. I encourage all of you to come back and see his presentation because like so many others, Tesla had connections with many important people. We talk about Berend, we talk about Kenneth M. Swayze, we talk about uh, Hugo Gertzbach, we talk about all these important and influential people in our lives. But it turns out, thanks to Jeff, uh, we mentioned the name Kinraid. We talk about pancake Tesla coils, not unlike what you see here. By the way, that's an enigma. I still want Lee Anderson to tell me what he knows about how this tower was driven from the powerhouse. There's a lot of unanswered questions here, folks, and a lot still needs to be rediscovered. It's forgotten. It's out there. It's, in fact, we were talking coming out here to Long Island just early this morning that a number of pieces of apparatus that were at Wardenclyffe, you know, they, they, were, they were pilfered. They were, uh, what do you call it? Uh, you call it? Uh, absconded? Uh, yeah, thank you, absconded. Evolved. And we were thinking, you know, probably if we dug deep enough in the surrounding area here, maybe some of those pieces are still here. Maybe some parts of the puzzle are still here at Shoreham, and they just need to be rediscovered. Yep. Many years ago, you may have talked to Robert Golka that he put an ad in the papers in this part of the country. Can you speak up louder? I'm sorry. Many years ago, I understand Robert Golka put an ad in the paper, in papers in this area of the country, asking just for that. And he did find some artifacts. One of them I understood he found was a tube, gas tube, as I recall, that somebody had, as a child, taken from the building and had it. And, uh, really? And I, I believe that was one, I think maybe the only thing I know of that I, I recall anyway that he did find, that he tried to do just what you're saying by just putting an ad out in the papers to say, anybody remember that building? Do you have anything that came out of it? That's a very interesting point. And Thank ask you. him about that directly. Okay. Now, has anybody in this room read or heard anything about Robert Golka in the past 10 years? 10 years, you said. 10 years, yeah. Jim? Well, I was, did I, did I tell that story? Oh, you weren't, you weren't here when I was saying he was, remember I told you when we did the uh, Halloween benefit at Ezra Cornell's house at, at Cornell for the fraternity that lives in it now. So it's not like Ezra's house anymore, it smells like beer and other things. And uh, so we